Hi, welcome to the Getting Started in Telemedicine webinar series. Uh, my name is Anne. Before we get started, I just have a few quick housekeeping things I want to go over. Um, there are the slides that Dr. Feldman are you, is using will is in the handout section, so you can download that if you have any trouble seeing the slides. Please submit your questions in the chat box. In the questions box, we'll try to get to them during the Q&A. And this session will be recorded, so you'll be able to review this. Um, it'll be sent out two, three days after the webinar. And this is the second in a series of six webinars. So we'll be talking about telemedicine reimbursement and billing in the next one, um, and then patient care in another one. So if you're interested in those, please go to vc.com slash webinars to sign up for those other webinars. Um, and I'll have the, that link for you also in your chat. Uh, so now let me go ahead and pass the time to Dr. Gary Goldman. Um, it's all yours. Thanks, Anne. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Alameda Contra Costa Medical Association uh, in association with Global Health Impact Network and VC. This webinar series is being made available to multiple Bay Area medical associations across the Bay Area. My name is Dr. Gary Goldman. I'm a council member for the ACCMA. I've been a practicing anesthesiologist at Alta Bates Medical Center, a Sutter Health affiliate in the East Bay since 1989. I'm also a serial entrepreneur in the digital health space and continuing education, international nursing staffing, and a cloud-based uh, health provider data management and credentialing platform. I'm currently and have been for the last eight years a Sutter Health in Physician Informatics Lead um, for the development, implementation, and optimization of electronic healthcare record. And I'm currently the founder and CEO of Global Health Impact Network, a clinician-driven collaborative network of clinical and digital health communities focused in the ecosystem of digital health innovation. We feel it's imperative that clinicians play an active role in what we believe is the precipice of a digital healthcare revolution. The ACCMA is a professional association of physicians who are committed to addressing health issues of concern to patients and doctors in the East Bay. We provide a forum for physicians to come together to improve public health, the quality of practice of medicine, and patients' access to care. This event is one example of among hundreds of activities that the ACCMA engages in every year to help physicians. These activities include political and public policy advocacy, things like holding local meetings with elected officials on health care legislation, regulatory compliance, things like ensuring network advocacy for covered California plans and helping members comply with Medicare reporting programs and practice management assistance, things like presenting ongoing seminars and webinars on practice. This webinar is in the second in a series of six, Getting Started in Telemedicine. Today's webinar will, will discuss medical malpractice considerations for telemedicine, presented by Dr. David Feldman, MD, MBA, and Chief Medical Officer for the Doctors Medical Malpractice Company, Healthcare Risk Advisors. If anyone has any questions, go to learning at accma.org or contact ACCMA at 510-654-5383. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, Yuli uh, K. Chetapali. Dr. Chetapali is a physician, researcher, author, and innovator. He's currently the president of Innovator MD, a healthcare innovation company. As a physician scientist, he is interested in technology-enabled care. He received the Pioneer Award for Innovation from Kaiser Permanente and Morris F. Colin Research Award from the Permanente Medical Group. His other roles include he is the current president-elect of the San Mateo County Medical Association, chairman of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs of the San Francisco Bay Area Chapter, He's an advisor, mentor, and an investor in various healthcare startups, and he is the author of Punish the Machine, The Promise of Artificial Intelligence in Healthcare. Yuli, take it away. Thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to um, host this uh, session. Thank you to ACCMA and VC. Um, today we are um, excited to have our guest speaker, Dr. David L. Feldman. Dr. Feldman, um, uh, welcome to the program. He is the Chief Medical Officer of the Doctors' Company Group, where he leads the group's education efforts. And he's the primary spokesperson for trends and issues on patient safety and risk management. 
He's also the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer and Healthcare Risk Advisors, a New York subsidiary. Dr. Feldman, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks so much for having me. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, sorry for the delay. So, um, appreciate all of your attention. I know this is a difficult time for everyone. And I'm hoping, uh, if nothing else, I can ease your mind about the risks around uh, telehealth and telemedicine. And if anything, I guess my message to all of you today is sort of threefold. The first is, um, certainly before all this happened, uh, a lot of this is a very state-based issue. Unfortunately, and we're hoping a lot of us that this might change as a result of this um, pandemic that we're in, but so many rules in the United States about practicing medicine are state-based, and it makes it very difficult to do things that have the potential to cross state lines. And we know this because that's the way our licenses are, both for physicians and nurses, and the same goes with laws around telemedicine. Some of, that, uh, some of these things have changed already as a result of the pandemic, at least temporarily, and our hope is that a lot of these things will change for the better going forward. The second point to know is that although there are risks, um, we shouldn't be afraid of them. Um, it's not as insurmountable as we think. I'll go over some of them with you, and hopefully you'll agree that these things are um, worth understanding, but not um, they should not be a barrier to doing this. And the final point I'd like to make is um, telemedicine is just a way of practicing. It's not medicine in and of itself. And so all the typical rules that all of us would want to apply as physicians still apply when we're using this particular tool. And so ultimately using your best judgment um, in the practice of good medicine is gonna get you through um, even what seem to be the most insurmountable risks. So I wanted to take just a few minutes at the beginning, you can take the next slide, Alan, thank you, to tell you a little bit, just a little bit of background I think is sort of fascinating. Um, don't see the next slide. There we go. Um, this comes from a study that was, um, that was done from a large national um, health insurance company. They looked at 142 million primary care visits among 94 million member years. So it's a huge database over a period of time from 08 to 16. What's fascinating is you can see that there's a 24% drop in primary care visits, 24%, no real change in specialty visits. And although you can't see it here because they're at the bottom and they're sort of, they're so small relative to the others, but there really is an increase in the number of urgent care and telemedicine visits. And this is just as of 2016. So the trend was already happening before this whole pandemic became upon us. Next slide, please, Anne. Some of you may be familiar with um, this work done by the American Medical Association. It's a follow-up uh, survey they did. Not a huge amount of physicians, maybe 15, 1,600 doctors, really trying to get a sense for physicians' appetite for digital health. So they compared their results from 16 to 19, and you can see the things that increased the most from 2016 to 19 were telehealth visits or virtual visits and remote monitoring for improved care. They literally were now 25% uh, of these physicians surveyed of their practices. So again, and this is just recently, this is from a study last year, things were already starting to ramp up before this whole uh, COVID-19 came upon us. Next slide. Most interesting for people like me is when they ask physicians what they thought the most important aspect of uh, trying to start using these digital tools was, malpractice was the top of the list. 57% thought it was very important. Um, and that also increased a bit from 2016 compared to all these other things that you can see about the EHR vendor, how well integrated it was, the data privacy, but malpractice was at the top of the list. So it's clearly uh, top of mind for a lot of clinicians before they want to get involved in, the, in, this, um, in this telemedicine world. Next slide. This is some interesting um, information that comes from the NEJM Catalyst is an offshoot of the New England Journal. Uh, it was just really came out in the last week about uh, what the barriers that doctors often perceived there were uh, with telehealth. Um, and we'll see how this has changed. But the first was that telemedicine is too hard. Um, and the fact is, most of us, myself included, have always done this. The telephone is telemedicine. Um, and not only that, we've all had 
smartphones for a long time. As a plastic surgeon, I can tell you I have had family members, even to this day, sending me pictures of their kids. Does it, do they need stitches or not? Or something along those lines. So we've all done this. It's just we've never done it with our patients. So it really isn't as hard as we think. Um, the other issue that people often worry about is that patients are going to prioritize relationships, the relationships with their clinicians over transactional care, meaning they really want to be in face-to-face -face with their doctors, not just have a transaction. But the fact is, in a patient-centric world, we know that patients want to do what's easier for them. That's why we're seeing so many um, patients using urgent care facilities when they can't get in to see their doctor. Uh, and I think we ought to keep that in mind, and especially now we're starting to see that even more. Another potential barrier is the physical exam. And I will tell you, as a, as a surgeon, I've always wondered how you do a good physical exam when the patient isn't in front of you. And yet, we'll talk a little bit more later on about some techniques that we can use to overcome some of these barriers. It's not perfect, but it's probably um, easier than you might think. Another element is the, the idea that a virtual visit is not effective. And I think a lot of us have already proven that to be uh, wrong in the last month. Uh, but you'll see why that really shouldn't be an effective barrier. And finally, the business model case, and that we know has changed. The topic today is not about billing, but I will tell you, and you'll probably hear more about this in upcoming webinars, that has changed certainly during this pandemic, and hopefully those will continue to be the case to make it a more viable business model. So these barriers are really probably myths more than they are in reality. Next slide, please, Anne. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the risks involved with telehealth for, for a few minutes. And again, the first point to remember is the whole idea of this being a state-based process. So it's not enough to say that your malpractice may not cover you if you're practicing telemedicine across state lines. It may actually be considered practicing medicine without a license, which is really a criminal offense. So it's more than just malpractice. So it's most important at the very beginning of this that you figure out where your patients are gonna be if you're using this, this tool, and where you're gonna be, and whether they're in the same state or not. Ideally, you're in the same state, so it's not an issue. But if you're gonna be practicing in another state, you need to know what the laws are, both the state you're in and the state your patient is in. The only exception I would say to this, and I've done this myself um, when I was in practice, you're taking care of a patient, it's one of your established patients, and they have an issue and they're visiting a relative or a friend in another state and they call you. Can you talk to them? And the answer again is, of course. Um, this goes to my third point, which is use your best judgment as uh, the, in the practice of good medicine. And that will certainly tell you, you're not gonna tell your patients you can't talk to them because they're in another state. Here we're talking mostly about establishing a patient uh, physician relationship when a patient's in another state, uh, something to discriminate between the in initial patient visit versus the established patient visit. But keep in mind that state licensing is critical and some of these rules have been relaxed during this pandemic. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Malpractice coverage obviously is critical. And again, your malpractice policy may have specific limitations about uh, practicing in another state. Um, many insurance companies will say they want most of your, um, your, your coverage and your, your practice to be, whether it be a telemedicine or, or live patients, to be in a state that they are in because if there is a lawsuit, there's huge differences in how you can defend a lawsuit from state to state. There are differences in the plaintiff's bar, there are differences in the rules, in the judges, in the courts. Um, so it's not just a matter of, of being uh, picky on the part of um, an insurance company, it's the reality of defending you in a malpractice claim and understanding the differences in venues. The final thing to, uh, to keep in mind with state licensing, and this was a, a positive thing that, again, maybe ramped up um, pretty quickly and given the pandemic we're in, is uh, the idea of trying to make it easier for physicians to be able to practice from state to state. And uh, a short while ago, they, this interstate medical licensure compact was created that involves, I think, about 26 states now, 26 states. It doesn't say that if you have a license in one state, you can automatically practice in the other, but it makes it very, or easier, I wouldn't say it's very easy, but easier than typically what it takes. And all of us know what it's like to get a license in any state, um, even if you have all the requirement, required documentation. It's, um, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. Of course, there are fees. Um, so this is a fairly easy or easier way of getting licensure in multiple states. The last I looked earlier today, New York is on the way to do this. That's where I am. 
California has not even considered it yet. But again, we may be um, not surprised to think that over the next few months as we get through this pandemic that this will change dramatically. At least that's the hope. Let's move on to a little bit about the physician-patient relationship. As I alluded to earlier, it's really critical to understand the differences in the kinds of patients you're seeing, and that is whether you're seeing a, one of your own patients um, in a telemedicine environment or a new patient. It's much easier to do this for your own patient because you've established the patient relationship already. Hopefully, you've taken care of some of the things we're going to talk about in, in some subsequent slides about informed consent and so forth and prepared your patient for it. Um, and it's your patient, so they know you have a relationship away already. Uh, before the pandemic, there were some states and, and some billing bodies that would require you to have your first visit in person. So you wouldn't even be eligible to have any kind of telemedicine relationship with your patient if you didn't start in, a, in an office setting uh, in a live situation. Now, of course, those have changed. We'll talk about that when we get, when we get further on here. And then, of course, the nature of the visit. Is the visit a follow-up visit? Is it a first well visit? Is it an emergency visit? Is it about prescriptions? What kind of prescriptions? These are important to understand because they do have a potential impact on what you're allowed to do and whether you should do it or not. Uh, clearly, if you get a call from a patient who you haven't seen and they want to do something virtually, you need to use your best judgment to decide whether that's appropriate or not. And that would also apply if you started a telehealth visit with a patient, and in the course of your talking with them and listening to them and watching them, you have the sense that this is going beyond your abilities to do in that kind of um, environment, in a telehealth environment. And that may be a time for you to say, you know, unfortunately, I'm not comfortable continuing this. You need to come to my office. You need to go to an emergency room or an urgent care center or change the nature of the visit. So that's important to remember as well. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about um, other things. Obviously, um, if you're talking malpractice, we're all conditioned to know that documentation is a big and important part of this. And this is no different in telemedicine than it is in live medicine. It's very important for you to document your decision making just like you would with any other visit with a patient. I suppose you could argue that it's a little even, it's, it's even more important um, in a telemedicine environment because here you only have the, the, the airwaves you're talking over and your, your patient isn't in your office and you don't have the advantages of the things you could do to document things in your office. So it's really important to keep documentation in mind. The technology is another critical piece of this. Um, and up until the pandemic, uh, we have to be careful about having HIPAA compliant technology. I think most of you probably know already, and we'll talk about this later, that these rules have been um, eased um, during this time frame. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but in a normal course of things, this is something to keep in mind and, and is critical. Insurance coverage. And here we're not just talking about malpractice insurance, we're talking about other types of insurance. We all should have cyber liability protection. That really is about your medical record uh, confidentiality and keeping that private and making sure it, it doesn't um, fall victim to a cyber crime. But now when we're talking to patients over the internet, it's even more important because the actual, your actual conversations are subject to the same sorts of uh, problems. So you really need to keep that in mind and make sure that whatever cyber, cyber liability coverage you have will now include these kinds of visits. Uh, privacy liability, obviously, business interruption. Um, most of us may not think about this. It's particularly relevant now if we can't do elective procedures if you're a surgeon. Um, do you have insurance to cover you for that? If you're the majority of your practice is telemedicine and all of a sudden you don't have internet, uh, your computer has a problem, um, then you can't operate the way you normally do and it would be good for you to have coverage for that if that extends over a period of time. That kind of business interruption insurance you might not have thought about um, if you weren't practicing telemedicine on a very a continuous and, and a, a large part of your practice. Part of the HIPAA arrangements, of course, are business associate agreements um, that goes hand in hand with making sure that your technology is HIPAA compliant, having agreements with the kinds of firms that you'll be using to perform telemedicine and telehealth visits. Uh, again, some of those have been relaxed in the current environment. The patient's environment. When a patient's in your office, you're both in the same environment you have control over. 
But now you have two environments to worry about, yours, where you are in your office or in your home, and where your patient is. And it's critical that your patient understand that as well. Obviously, your visit with your patient is, is confidential, and they need to know that only the people that they want to be in the room with them when you're having your visit with them uh, should be there. And that's something to keep your, your uh, patients appraised of, and their home situation may or may not be amenable to that. It's an important conversation to have beforehand. Uh, billing, obviously, is not going to be the topic of this, but that's something you want to keep in mind, especially when we're dealing with Medicare and Medicaid, because their rules can be uh, very complicated. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about um, informed consent, a critical part of any care. Again, this, this is that theme again of practicing good medicine and using your best judgment. These are all things, most of these things you would probably do in, a normal, um, in your normal practice with patients who are in front of you. Um, they just become more critical to think about when you're uh, seeing patients in a virtual way. Again, there are other state-specific requirements. They can differ. Um, and every state may have their own rules about what's acceptable informed consent for a telemedicine visit. You want to make sure that you tell your patients who's going to be participating with you, who's on your side, because they may not be able to see them. Is a nurse, is a, a, um, a health technologist going to be, healthcare technologist going to be in the room with you? Um, and you need to make sure that you let your patients know who those folks are going to be, just like you normally would, only it's more obvious when they're in your office. You need to let your patients know that they can refuse or stop uh, treatment using this modality at any time. They have the right to do that. That seems obvious, but it's important to emphasize that with your patients. You need to let them know what kind of technology you're going to be using. Um, that's critical for them to know so that they know exactly how you're going to be uh, conversing with them and whether there'll be video and what that's going to require as well, what the privacy and security risks are. Obviously, they're greater if you're using um, technology than you would be in your office, so you need to make sure you let them know that and what the, those specific, uh, specific risks might be. Um, interruption, your Wi-Fi goes down, poor quality. I think all of us now over the last month have participated, I'm sure like most of you, in, in Zoom calls and in uh, webinars, go to meetings and, and Skype, and they're not perfect. Uh, of course, they're being overloaded now, so it's a little unusual. But even in a normal situation, some of these things we don't have control over. Uh, and you want to make sure you advise your patients of that possibility. Uh, of course, you want to ask their permission to build using this kind of um, technology and this, this modality. Uh, that varies. Uh, we now know that that's changed a bit for the positive during the pandemic. Uh, but typically, there may be issues with that. And you need to make sure your patient is aware of what uh, their insurance will cover and what it won't. Um, you need to make sure your patient knows what alternatives there are. If there's an emergency or a technology malfunction, if you decide that after talking with a patient for 10 minutes that this is not an appropriate modality to use, you need to let them know what you have in mind if it doesn't work, whether they need to come to your office or maybe you'd go to their home or something in between. And then ideally, not surprising that you'll hear this from me, but you want to document this. Um, I think before the pandemic, typically there were requirements for a written consent from a patient. Some of those regulations have been relaxed. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but ideally, just like before any procedure, as a surgeon, I tell my colleagues the same thing. You want your typical signed consent form, but you also want a note in the chart explaining that you've talked to the patient about having visits now done virtually through a telemedicine, how you're going to do it. They've agreed to it. You've explained all the risks, benefits, and alternatives just like you would for any other uh, procedure that you're doing with a patient. You want to follow the same rules. So that's important to keep in mind. Next slide, please, Anne. Thank you. So let's talk about some tips. Um, these are kind of interesting. Um, this is a term that I, I, uh, I just came across not too long ago. Some of you may be familiar with it, a website matter. And I think all of us have learned these four points probably wouldn't surprise anybody now probably a month or month and a half ago, some of these might not be so obvious, but now they are. Um, is your camera at eye level? And I'm struggling with that now. I'm trying to maintain my focus so you can see that I'm looking at you. Um, but I'm giving a talk to a, to a group of physicians. Imagine if you're the patient and it looks like your doctor is staring up at the wall when you're talking with them. Um, it's the same sort of idea as a patient in a room. You're in a room with a patient or in a in a hospital room with a patient and you're not sitting down. It has that same effect 
um, on the patient their perception that you're not listening to them. So make sure that you can adjust your camera to be at eye level. Make sure you're wearing clothes that work best on a video screen. Um, and people in media understand this. Typically, as physicians, why would we, unless we work with the media? Solid colors are good. You don't want to have things that are too um, obvious or really bright colors that are distracting. Um, and this is something that takes some time to learn what colors and clothes are going to work best on a video screen. If it's a first visit with a patient, it's probably not a bad idea to have a badge, probably in a white coat. Um, it may be different if it's a pediatric patient, as usual. If it's a patient you know, the white coat, white is probably not a good color to have on a video screen, so there's a bit of a tension here uh, between having the right um, um, clothes that work on a video screen with ones to identify you to a new patient as a physician. Um, my suggestion is on a first visit, it's probably not a bad idea to have a white coat and a badge so they know who you are with some kind of official recognition that you are who, you, who you're supposed to be. Again, if it's a follow-up visit with a patient that you know, that's obviously not as necessary. And then, of course, you don't want to have distractions behind you. Um, having your kids playing behind you when you're doing a telehealth visit is probably not a good idea. Um, you want to take a look at what's behind you and see what your patient's going to see. Uh, to make sure that they feel like you're giving them their full attention. Uh, so all these things, things seem obvious, but we don't think of them um, when we're doing this kind of uh, virtual visit. I highly recommend that you do a pre-visit um, that often can be done with your staff, making sure that their patients and your office, if that's where you're going to be, has the right technology, that it works beforehand, that makes the, the visit much more streamlined. It gives you the workflow. A lot of this is getting your office workflow to readjust to this new type of, type of technology. And I think that makes things go a lot smoother when you're actually seeing the patient. There can be a virtual waiting room for your patient so that uh, you know who's coming up next so they're not waiting or worse, they call in and they're seeing your visit with another patient. And all this is important to get straight before you actually have your visit so it goes smoother and obviously there's gonna be less risk that way. The physical exam I alluded to before, um, there are lots of ways to get around putting your hands on the patient and still getting information that you find helpful. Uh, Ottawa rules, some of you may be familiar with, I think um, ER, ER physicians might be. These were rules set up to help ED docs determine when patients need x-rays. Uh, they're mostly orthopedic related, but it's a, a great help if you have a patient that you're seeing virtually and they have a significant other next to them who can do some of these maneuvers gives you a sense of whether you need an x-ray or not, whether you need to do something more without actually you examining the patient. In the time of COVID, this raw score, which was um, interesting, I'm happy to give you the reference if you'd like, about having a patient count to 30 while they're taking a breath in. Um, and it's a great, it's a very sensitive and specific indicator for oxygen saturation. And that's easy to do and you get a very good sense of whether your patient is short of breath or not, which is clearly something critical to know um, these days. And finally, just uh, many of you may know this already, but you know, what are the options for this? A so-called native telemedicine uh, product is typically an EMR as a, that has the capabilities of doing telemedicine visits. And, and a lot of EMRs do that. That's certainly the easiest. You don't have to open too many screens. Everything's sort of set up to you already. If it's something you already use, you know they're going to be HIPAA compliant because you use them already. Um, but it, your, your EMR may not have the capability. A standalone system is a separate program. Um, VC is one of them as an example. Uh, Doxy.com, Doxy.me. Uh, there's lots out there that are standalone products that do a lot of these things for you. And then the hybrid, which is a lot of what uh, physicians are using now as they start on this journey, is really having your EMR. And then next to that, your uh, FaceTime app, which you can use currently, or some other way of um, communicating with the patient by audio and video and having your electronic medical record open next to it so you can document while you're speaking to them. That's the so-called hybrid technique. Next slide. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about malpractice. Um, the good news, um, I always find it funny to use the term good news and malpractice in the same sentence. It's kind of an oxymoron, but there is some good news with malpractice when it comes to, to telehealth. Um, it, Still, um, even though it's increased in the last 15 years, and remember, everything in malpractice lags years behind, so we're not going to see the impact of telemedicine, as an example, on the pandemic for years. Um, hopefully, we won't see any at all. 
Um, but even in the last 15 years, if we compare earlier times until more recent times, it's increased, but it's still a very minor part of our malpractice profile uh, from our malpractice reviews. What are these claims about? 60, 70% of them are typically about diagnostic errors. That probably wouldn't be a surprise to many of you. And a lot of them are about cancer, but not exclusively stroke, infections, orthopedic issues make up the sort of spectrum, if you will, of kind of malpractice claims around diagnostic errors where telemedicine is a component of the claim. The, main, the amount paid in these claims is typically uh, higher than average. It probably reflects the fact that there are a lot of those are diagnostic errors. Those tend to be claims that are higher, have higher payments in general. Uh, and the telemedicine diagnostic error claims are probably no different, but that hasn't really changed over the last 10 or 15 years. Next slide. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, telehealth and coronavirus. There's actually a lot to talk about. Um, and it's unfortunately, as most of us know, literally changing by the day. In fact, um, there's one element on this slide um, that uh, should be available, and I'll, I'll make this available later, that has already changed literally in the last few days. Um, but let's start with federal rules. Obviously, the, the CMS website is a good resource for that. Medicare uh, for uh, compensation, not just compensation, but what their rules are, are important to know. And then we also know about HIPAA, which is uh, comes under the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, that has changed recently. I think you can um, easily find those uh, to basically say that they've uh, suspended the HIPAA regulations as it, uh, as it applies to telemedicine uh, modalities. However, they have to be uh, non-public facing entities. So using Facebook Live is not a good idea, but you could use something like um, your iPhone's uh, FaceTime chat, um, uh, or those kinds of things. And even though it's not HIPAA compliant, it's allowable under the current uh, emergency declaration that we're in. So that's an important thing for you, for us to know you can get started right away. The problem of course with that is if you start using those things now and those rules and exemptions go away, then you're sort of back to, to square one. So my suggestion is if you have the time to get a HIPAA compliant telemedicine product, it's probably not a bad idea uh, in case things change when the pandemic is, is over. Obviously, as I said before, one of my three big tenants about all of this is state rules. Medicaid is typically a state-run um, program with federal support, so you need to know what your state Medicaid rules are, both about um, billing and about uh, what's allowed. Uh, and then, of course, your Department of Health in each of your states uh, will allow you to take a look at what their rules are. Um, and I have some updates I can tell you about California specifically because uh, our listeners are, are mostly of all in California. And of course, you want to check with your professional liability insurer. The one update I will say um, that just came in the last few days, many of you are aware that the FCC has now issued a $200 million grant uh, for physicians to start their telemedicine um, programs. Literally at 12 noon today, I think Eastern time, their website became live. I'm happy to send you that link, but you could probably Google it and, and get to it anyway. Um, so there's funding available from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, to start telemedicine programs, which I think is great, um, and it's another opportunity for clinicians to get involved in this. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about um, California, uh, since uh, this is a California-based webinar. I'm happy to do that. Um, again, these are changing literally by the minute. Um, this is sort of a summary that we, we gleaned, but these are all available either on your California uh, website or the California Medical Association and probably your, your local medical associations have lots of these questions uh, and answer for you too. Um, just like um, the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, California has laws also about privacy, <clears throat> HIPAA related sorts of things that actually supersede the federal government. They've typically been more stringent but Governor Newsom has an executive order that now aligns with what the Office of Civil Rights is saying about suspension of HIPAA. The laws remain in place technically, but the penalties have been suspended. It's kind of a weird um, way of doing this, but the bottom line for you is that if you're using telehealth, you, have the, you don't have to worry about the, um, the HIPAA types of regulations as they apply to California. Uh, California has uh, re um, temporarily removed the requirement for a formal uh, consent for telehealth, again, I would urge you to document this, even if it's verbal. 
with your patient to document this in your medical record that you have had this conversation and you've gotten their permission to have this kind of interaction with them. And then finally, controlled substances. This is always a critical thing. Um, in general, most states require a first visit um, if you're going to prescribe controlled substances be in person. Um, for California, they've waived the in-person visit, but you must comply with three things. It has to be a legitimate prescription. It has to be a real-time visit, uh, meaning you have a live conversation, both audio and video with your patient, and it has to be meet all other federal and state guidelines. Um, so again, uh, this is making things a little easier for clinicians, but please keep in mind what the rules are, even though even the relaxed ones. Next slide, and I think we're just about through. We'll have time for some questions. I uh, just wanted to give you a sense. Uh, this is from, from one institution about what's happened over just literally um, the last month. This is uh, just in the middle of March when we really started to see this pandemic and people really required to being at home. The number of office visits and telehealth visits are literally flip-flopped. Now, will this uh, go on after the pandemic? I personally believe that telemedicine is here to stay. Um, it's a very patient-centric uh, way of practicing medicine. I think we saw what the trends were before all this started. This has just amped it up. It's just accelerated things, I think, for the better. Um, it's a very, again, patient-centric way of practicing medicine. Patients want this if we can find a way to do this in a way that we think is consistent with the practice of good medicine and using our best judgment, I think it's a great thing all around. Next slide, I think, is just some resources for, for you, um, the things to keep in mind in general. There is an American Telemedicine Association that's worth taking a look at. Of course, the AMA has their own um, uh, white paper on ethical practice in telehealth and telemedicine. Uh, the American Society of Healthcare Risk Management has a nice white paper you can take a look at. All of this, by the way, predates uh, coronavirus, so it won't have any of those things in it, but there's some nice guidelines. And then uh, there's a Center for Connected Health Policy that has some nice information that they're updating fairly frequently as well. So uh, feel free to take a look at that. And I think, uh, Anne, that ends my former remarks. And I believe we're ready to take some questions. Willie? Sure. Thank you, David. Uh, that was uh, a very um, clear picture that you painted for us about telemedicine and the risks of telemedicine for physicians. Um, I have a few questions uh, that are coming up on the screen right now, but uh, the first one is from Norris. And uh, Norris asks, what about international patients? You know, what are the risks there? I'm sorry, the risks of? International patients. International patients. Well, that's a good question. Um, the problem is now you're subject to the laws of whatever country that patient is in. Um, and unless you know what that is, I'd be pretty concerned. Unless, again, it's one of your own patients. You yeah. have an established patient that you've known and they happen to be overseas, probably because they're stuck there and maybe they were on vacation and can't come back. Again, use your best judgment. Um, you Obviously, you want to be helpful. Um, if you're going to get them on the phone or through an audiovisual conference, I mean, I think that's fine. But again, you need to use your judgment if you get to a point where you have to tell your patient, look, I'm not comfortable continuing this. I think you really need to see somebody in person. You need more extensive testing, whatever it is. So if it's an established patient, again, I, I, you, you need to do what's best for your patient. And, and this is no different, whether they're in a foreign country or, or in your state or in another state. Um, use your best judgment. Document what you've done. And, and make sure you give patients the best advice you can. Sure. Thank you. Um, the next question comes from Zishan. And Zishan asks, uh, who pays for the insurance? You know, does the organization pay or the physician has to carry the insurance, malpractice insurance? Who pays? So who pays for the insurance? Yes. Yeah. So um, you're providing, just like any other encounter with a patient, live or by phone or by video, um, you need the insurance for yourself, uh, your malpractice insurance. And you should check with your current malpractice carrier. Many carriers insurance, um, that's true with our company, includes coverage for telemedicine. But you want to verify that before uh, going down that road and make sure you understand what their rules are. As I said, a lot of malpractice insurers will cover it, but they may have some um, they may have some cautions about practicing um, telemedicine with a patient who's in another state. 
So you need to get that um, understanding from them. That's why I said contacting your professional liability insurer is probably one of the first things you want to do. But the good news is it's really part of most policies. It's just another way of practicing medicine. It's when you get patients in another state that it gets a little complicated. Was there a question about other payments or is it just the malpractice insurance? Just a malpractice. Great. Um, so um, uh, Sonia asks, is there any difference between practicing at you know from home versus practicing from the clinic as far as risks are concerned? Well, that's a great question. Um, there are billing issues that I'm not going to answer because I don't know the answer to them, except it could be a billing issue. As far as a risk issue goes, <clears throat> it's everything we said before. Um, you really can be anywhere, but you have to then realize where you are, what's going on in your home. You don't want to be having a telemedicine visit with a patient and your, your spouse or your significant other or your children come running in the room. Think about what your patient would think. Um, it doesn't go over well. So all these things that you wouldn't even have to think about if you're in your office or the clinic, all of a sudden have to go through your mind. Uh, what you're wearing, what's your background, how do you adjust the camera, all these things are important. It's website matter that none of us typically think about, but risk-wise, um, there really is no difference, assuming, again, that your home is in the same state as your office, obviously. Assuming that's the case, I, I think it's more of these other things that you want to make sure your patient is comfortable with, and, of course, advising your patient of that. What if, what if, what if the physician is on vacation somewhere and they're you know, communicating with their patients in, in, in their home state. Is that okay? You know, yeah, same thing applies. And it, look, that's happened to me too, right? We're, we're dedicated folks. And look, sometimes you're, um, you know, you're, you, uh, you have somebody covering for you when you're on vacation, but it's one of your patients. Your covering doctor calls you and said, listen, you know, Mrs. Jones really has this issue and she really wants to talk to you and you want to do the right thing. So of course you're going to talk to them. And those are, you know, they're one-offs. I really don't think anybody's going to have an issue with that. It's an ongoing relationship with a current patient. I've done it myself because you want to provide the best care for your patient using your best judgment. But again, now remember, you're on vacation. You want to document your conversation, right? <laughs> you may not have access to your EMR if you're somewhere. Um, at least write things down, but you want to memorialize that when you get back to your office. You want to put that in the chart and say, you know, on such and such a date, uh, I was out of the office and my patient called me and, and document what you told them and so forth. But, uh, you know, listen, that's just, that's the practice of good medicine. Yeah, yeah. Um, David asks, um, he says that he carries his own practice insurance, but uh, he hasn't started practicing telehealth yet. So should he, should he ask for a specific coverage, additional coverage for telehealth? So he has his own malpractice already, personal yeah. malpractice, right? He hasn't, he hasn't uh, practiced telemedicine yet. He hasn't practiced telemedicine yet. Again, uh, easiest thing to do is to contact his malpractice insurer and say, hi, just want you to know I'm really, I really would like to start practicing telemedicine. I wanted to know if it's covered under my policy, and if so, what the limitations are. Get all the details, and it's probably a good idea to get it in writing, and an email is probably fine. So you know exactly what the rules are to comply with your coverage so that you have coverage for doing that. And I'm sure the first question they're going to ask is, are your patients going to be in-state or not? Because that's always the most important rule. And again, remember, this is not about necessarily um, trying to be a pain and say, well, you know, other states. It's understanding the venues. And if there's a lawsuit in another venue, that's in, sometimes in, I'm in New York. It could be just somewhere else within New York State. Uh, but certainly in another state, the rules are different and the ability for your insurance um, to cover you appropriately changes if you're in a different state. So it really is in your own best interest to understand um, what those risks are and make sure you're covered appropriately for that. And some, by the way, some insurance companies may say, listen, no problem. Your patient's in New Jersey. Uh, that's okay. We know what the laws are there. You have a license there. We're familiar with that venue. So God forbid there's a lawsuit. We can cover you to the best of our ability. Those are the kinds of things you want to know and why you want to know that. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about you know, what are the uh, liabilities when uh, you know, patients get their own vital sign? Um, other than you know, the accuracy of the measurements, you know, is there anything else we need to be um, careful about? 
Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? Um, and, and we all know there's newer technology coming out to help us with these things. I've seen, as many of you have, I'm sure, devices that you can attach to your iPhone, there's the, the watch and um, that supposedly does EKGs. Um, to the extent that they're reliable, uh, it's a great help. But how do you know if they're reliable and if a patient's taking their own pulse, maybe they're calculating it wrong and so forth. Uh, there may be techniques to use, but in the end, I think it's important to use your best judgment again. And remember, that's only one piece of the picture. A patient describes an event to you, right? And they're giving you a pulse rate that doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in, right? They're telling you they're hot and sweaty and they, they don't feel well and their pulse is 60. Yeah, I'm thinking, I don't know. That doesn't really make any sense to me. You want to question it, maybe have them repeat it. Um, like any other lab value, we've all had abnormal lab values that we don't believe. Um, it's really the same thing. It has to be put into the entire picture of what your patient is telling you, but you have to be even more cautious here because you're relying on a patient now who's, you know, could be a lay person that doesn't really, isn't familiar with doing this. And again, document all of it. Document yeah. why you didn't really believe that their pulse was truly 60 because of all these other things. Again, you're using your best judgment in, in the best way you can. And if you're really nervous, tell them to go to an urgent care where they can measure it more accurately if that really is the picture. Thank you. Uh, Emmanuel asks, uh, regarding the visit, you know, I'm sure you know, we have to document that, but what about patients recording the visit? Yeah, well, we have that issue without being in, in, a, in, in a telemedicine venue, right? Um, you could be seeing a patient, they could be recording you and you wouldn't know it. People have devices that do all sorts of things. And we've had those questions uh, and our answer is, and it depends again on the, on the state you're in. In many states, um, you don't need both parties' permission to record a conversation. That's true in New York. One party to the conversation has to approve, the other does not necessarily. So if I'm seeing a patient in my office in New York and he or she decides to record the conversation, they don't have to get my permission to do that and they could use that in any way they want. So our advice to everybody is, assume patients are recording everything you say. Frankly, if you walk outside your house, you could be recorded too. We live in a world where everything is recorded and ends up on, you know, on the internet the next day. So just assume whatever you're talking to the patient about, whatever you're doing is going to be recorded and seen by somebody else, potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people. That's my first suggestion. Um, as far as you recording, I think we're getting to the point where a lot of our uh, records are all going to be recorded. It's in some ways what people are calling an AI scribe, right? I mean, this is a little off topic, but I think it's an exciting area. Getting yeah. away from people having to record, even, right, even in an EMR, having a, an audio file being monitored by somebody else and then having the machines basically generate a record from an audio and video file. I think that's an exciting, um, exciting technology that will really make things so much better for us. But I would assume your patient is recording things. Um, if you're recording it, you have to tell the patient. I think that's the right thing to do. Um, many of them won't have a problem with that because they know it's a better way of keeping records. But assume they're recording you. Great. Um, Emmanuel asks, um, are, are there any good resources where you can go? Because when you're going to practice telemedicine for the first time, you want to know, you know, what are the conditions that I can see? What are the conditions that, that should not be seen through telemedicine? Is there a place like that where they can go and check, check the list? Yeah, I think a lot depends on your specialty, right? So I'm a plastic surgeon. Uh, I haven't practiced in a while, but it, it's hard for me to imagine what kinds of scenarios are going to be amenable to a telehealth visit. Maybe a, you know, a preoperative um, breast reconstruction visit. Maybe some of that can be done virtually, right? But there's still an exam. There's still a lot of other things that are, are going to be very difficult to do. So the first thing I would say is it depends on your specialty. Other specialties are very amenable to this. So the first place to check is your specialty society. Um, this is becoming more and more ubiquitous, certainly will be after this pandemic, God willing, when it's over. Um, and check your specialty society's website, and they may have some, you know, tips that are really applicable to your kind of practice. Otherwise, general, um, you know, general tips that may not, be, may not be worthwhile for you to look at if they don't apply to the kind of practice you have. So I think it's worth checking your specialty society. And then some of the, excuse me, some of the references I 
I gave in a few slides ago, checking those websites, they may have um, specialty specific guidelines on what's appropriate to do by telemedicine and what's not. And then at the end of the day, I know I sound like a broken record, use your best judgment. If it doesn't feel right to you, don't do it. I mean, we learned that, you know, in medical school, right? If you have this sixth sense that maybe you should admit the patient, admit the patient, right? That kind of thing. If you have the sixth sense, this doesn't feel right for me to do this via telemedicine, just don't do it. And tell your patient honestly why you believe that, and you'll be okay. Great. Um, the next question comes from Nina. Uh, Nina's question is, uh, what if the insurance is in a different state than the patient and the physician? Does that make any difference? The location of the- The, mal the malpractice insurance? The health insurance. The health insurance. Yeah. Well, that's just a billing issue, really, okay. right? If your health insurance is, then it's a question of whether they're going to pay for it or not. And that you know, that depends on a whole lot of things. But you'd have to check the health insurer's rules about payment for telehealth. I, I can't have a generic answer to that. I suspect maybe some of your future webinars will get to that about billing and so forth and how that's changed and whether if you're across state lines, uh, the health insurer will, will cover a visit like that. Um, you talked about uh, consent. Um, Jamie asks, what if the patient cannot use the technology to consent? You know, the patient is old or, or not able to understand. Um, is there an alternate method for getting a consent? Yeah, so so uh, obviously in that situation, and look, some of our patients are don't have the, the facility to use technology. A phone may be all you could do, right? Um, but this is why, again, ideally, uh, those kinds of patients, you want to have your first visit in an office. So you can explain things to them, get an understanding of what they're comfortable with, what they're not, and then you can do your consent there where everything can be written down, you can give them something to read and so forth. If your first visit is with a patient like this and it's in their home and you're unable to have them physically in your, in your office or clinic, then you're gonna, again, have to do the best you can. And I think a verbal consent under these circumstances is, is acceptable. That may change, but in our current situation, as you saw, certainly in California and, and in many states now, it's acceptable to have that first visit um, remotely. And if it's a patient who's only able to use a phone and doesn't have the ability to view a screen and so forth, I think you're gonna have to take a little time to explain it to them and then document that you gave a verbal, they gave their verbal consent um, and, and document exactly what you told them. Uh, that's, that's the only choice you have. Uh, and here again, if you feel like the patient is just not understanding it, then it may not be appropriate to do that kind of visit virtually. And it's, tough, it's tough if you're on the phone, you, you know, you're, you're missing a lot. Even here, we're, we're talking video and you can see patients, but you still miss some of the parts of how we communicate, right? They say 80% of how we communicate is not what we're saying, it's all the other things. <laughs> um, you miss some of that. You certainly miss that with texting. You miss it with phones. You miss less of it with video, uh, but it's not the same thing as being there. And that may be okay. You just have to use your best judgment to figure out whether it is or not. Great. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, David. He asks, you know, we're, now we are in this COVID season and there's a lot of uh, ads for these telehealth jobs, you know, online and also, you know, very targeted advertisements. Uh, what are the things that we need to look for when we are figuring out which telehealth company to work for? Yeah, no, I've seen those myself actually, and that's, uh, I suspect that's not gonna go away so quickly either. Uh, I would say it's like any other prospective um, position that you'd wanna take, right? So. Um, even when we, you know, when you started in practice and you were looking for practices to join or a hospital to join, you want to be asking the same sorts of questions, right? So where, first of all, where is this place located? How many doctors do they have? What kind of um, uh, services are they offering? Uh, yeah, obviously you want to ask about compensation. What about insurance? How is that covered? All the typical questions you'd ask before any other uh, prospective job. Here, the risks are a little higher. Some of the things we reviewed, you'd want to ask them, what platform are they using? Is it HIPAA compliant? Even though that's not necessary now, to me, if you're going to sign up with a big telehealth company, 
you know, you don't want to make the investment with this company and find out in another month when the pandemic is over that all of a sudden they don't have a HIPAA compliant product and you're mm -hmm. sort of have to go looking around again. So it's probably worth if you're going to go to that, you know, to that extent to sign on with a company, really make sure you understand that they're complying with all the usual rules, um, even if some have been relaxed. I think that's important to know. Um, but, you, you know, use your best judgment about it. And it's not going to be so easy. Some of the uh, websites I, I referred you to on the American Telemedicine Association, the AMA, Ashram, they may have some guidelines on telehealth providers and, and which ones to be careful about. Uh, but usually your judgment is going to give you a sense for whether it's the right one or not. Great. One, one last question as we are coming up to the end of the, our hour. Um, Rebecca asks, she practices in New York City and she has patients who live in New Jersey and Medicaid, uh and they are established patients. So is she covered for telehealth when she does telemedicine with those patients in our state? Yeah. So these are established patients that she's seen previously in her office in New York City. Yeah, yeah. I, I would think for now she ought to check the, the rules in uh, New Jersey and Connecticut, but I'm sure uh, they have probably suspended licensing requirements during this time. And they're her patients, right? So, um, yeah. you know, chances are it would be fine anyway, but it's probably not a bad idea to check with that and then check with her insurance carrier to be sure. But I, I can't see that that's going to be a problem during this crisis to have patients that are your own who happen to be living in another state. They normally come to your office. Um, you know, during this crisis, you want to be providing them with care, continuing to provide them with care in the right way. So you don't have to go to a hospital or an urgent care center or somebody's office they've never met before. One or two phone calls um, to your malpractice carrier, and, and maybe just taking a quick look at what the laws are in, in those other states, and, and I think it'll be fine. It shouldn't take much, but my sense is it should not be a problem for now. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. You've been uh, you know, gracious and patient with answering questions. We really appreciate that, and uh, thank you for all the listeners uh, that have tuned in, and thank you to Gary and ACCMA and uh, the VC, the organizers of this uh, telehealth series. Uh, for the uh, attendees, you know, attendees, and, uh, five more coming up. So five more coming up. So looking at different aspects of uh, telemedicine. It's been my pleasure. My pleasure to join you. Thank you, Yuli. Thank, Thank you, David. My pleasure Thank to you. join you. Bye bye. Great. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Have a good. Thank you. And just, um, I just want to let you know that the link to signing up for the other webinars in the series are in the chat. So if you want to grab that, um, make sure to sign up. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.